This episode of Brains on Games is about the top games with Canadian designers. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about the very best games that were designed by Canadians. I had a chance a few weeks ago to speak with a couple of Canadian board game designers, and what I wanted to know from them was, what are your top 10 very best family games that have Canadian game designers? And oddly enough, they didn't put their own games on their list. They didn't share their list with each other either, so we get to see what kind of overlap there is between two game designers' ideas about what are the best Canadian games. I recorded this interview at my office because my internet connection there is so much more stable than my connection at home, but it is a Zoom interview, so the video and the sound are not quite the same as the videos that I record here in my so-called studio at my house. But without further ado, let's get right into it and talk with Daryl Andrews and Sen Fung Lim. We are going to start by having the two of you guys introduce yourselves, and since we're we're meeting together for Canada Day. Let's talk to the guy first with the Canada jersey on. Woo-hoo. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just as excited to celebrate Canadian design games. There's a lot of good good games out there. I didn't realize, honestly, I didn't realize until I saw both of your lists how, how many Canadian connections there are in the board game universe besides the two of you. But introduce yourself and... Tell us a little bit about your connection with board games. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Daryl Andrews, uh, and I'm a freelance game designer. I have been uh, close to 10 years now, and uh, especially the last few years, got to do it full time, which is a, a real privilege and um, just goes to show like how much games are growing and, and opportunities. And, and we'll be talking about a lot of champions, including Sen was a, a mentor and an influence on me getting into this industry. Um, but yeah, my most well-known game is Sagrada, which I co-designed with Adrian Adamescu, another great Canadian designer. And, and I've had the privilege of working with a bunch of other great designers, uh, some Canadian, some not. Awesome. Sen, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Sen Fung Lim. I use he, him pronouns. I am a freelance game designer from London, Ontario, Canada. And I've been in this business just a couple more years than Daryl. That's, that's how I got to mentor Daryl. Just I had that you know, a few more steps along the path than he did. Uh, and like Daryl, I've done a lot of co-design. So most of my co-designers actually are Canadian, um, including Jay Corbier, Jesse Wright, Helena Hope, um, Erica Buras, who's also one of Daryl's frequent co-designers. And even my other co-designer who I write RPGs with, role-playing games with, Banana Chan, is actually has a Canadian connection as well. She immigrated from Hong Kong to Canada and then she moved to the States eventually. But yeah, so everybody has a Canadian connection. So there you go. She's an honorary Canadian, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. So my plan today is to be a student. You can both mentor me because I've got lists, top 10 lists of, of board games with the Canadian connection from each of you. And I thought we would count down and some of them, I, I've seen your list now. Some, some of these games I'm more familiar with than others, so I'm looking forward to talking about them. Uh, but who wants to go first with their number 10 game? I'll go, I'll go first. I, sure. And I, 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 w- I don't know if this made Sen's list, but I think it might have. But we'll find out. I actually went pretty old school with, uh, with my number 10. And just to give a shout out, I'm, I'm from uh, Waterloo, Ontario, and very nearby my region, this game was invented. And the international championship for this game actually takes place in Tavistock, which is just a 30 minute drive from my house. And that is Crokino. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with it's a dexterity game where you flick discs on a round board. There's some pegs that get in the way. It seems like way too often. <laughs> and you're trying to shoot into the middle while also uh, knocking your opponent's discs off the board as well. So Crokino is my number 10. Uh, I had to look it up, but it was invented in 1876. Yes. Wow. That is a wow. great one. I didn't actually think about that because I was thinking more of modern stuff. Uh, but that is awesome because, yeah, Tavistock is kind of in between where Daryl and I are both located. Um, and I often tell people 
who are, you know, the Americans are saying, Hey, where can I get a good crocodile board and all this kind of stuff. So you got to come to Ontario where yeah. it sort of has a very big life uh, yeah. and come for the championships when you're able to. So I have friends who have played in the championships, um, you know, number six in the world and stuff like that. And it's a big deal. It's a, it's actually a pretty big deal. My father-in-law loves crocodile and he can sink that 20 spot. Like, just repeatedly yeah it's just like the, bam the bam, 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 bam bam over and over it's again. annoying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm pretty good at dexterity games but i don't practice i guess like he does so, yeah. so he's retired he has the time i guess <laughs> <laughs> i have a board on my table all all the time i had one made locally and uh you know i'll, I'll flick those discs if i happen to be walking by and i'm not in a rush <laughs> to do something else yeah. uh i i can't be consistent with the 20 point but I'll tell you what I love about dexterity games is, is it's one of the few games, at least at our house, where people's hands are in the air and they're cheering when they do something spectacular, right? Oh, you don't yeah, always totally. get, sometimes you get that from strategy games. You don't, sure. you don't always get it from strategy games, at least at our house. Yep. Uh, there's more cheering and trash talk when we play Crokinole than almost anything. And because it's always out on our table, then we very often just get a game going because it's sitting there ready yeah. to play. I would have put it higher though, Daryl. That's fair. Not to start fair, a fight. Fair, fair, fair. I would have put it higher on my list, but yeah. I'm a dexterity game lover for sure. I didn't even put it on my list again. So, uh, but I did put this game on my list. My number 10 is a game that doesn't exist yet. Well, it exists, uh, but it's not out for retail yet. It hasn't even hit Kickstarter yet. It is Steam Up uh, by Pauline Fake Kong and Marie Wong of Hot Banana Games. And um, this is by far and large the only game I've ever wanted before it's ever come out. I don't, I'm not a, you know, a big person to um, have FOMO or anything like that, or, or really, um, you know, wait for the Kickstarter. Oh my God, the Kickstarter is coming out. But this one I've seen since its inception. Um, and I've talked to, you know, the designers quite a bit about it. And because it's part of my heritage, it is something that I am super looking forward to as something that will be representative of my culture in a very correct fashion. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to it. It looks super cool, super cute. Uh, and so it's coming out on Kickstarter this year. So we'll see how that how that does. I'm I'm sure it'll be super successful. It's got so much buzz around it already, and I'm, I'm just, just here say, I'm pumping it up a little more. Great. Yeah, I'm super excited for it. it uh, for anyone who doesn't know, you gotta look it up, and then you gotta resist eating it because they did such an incredible job making it look <laughs> uh, so delicious. It's like you know, like sometimes I'm tempted to eat the eggs from Wingspan. Well, this is another one of those games <laughs> where I'm gonna be tempted to eat the components. <laughs> Don't eat the eggs from Wingspan. <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> don't do that. No, don't do that. that. That would not be good for you. What are the, what are the, what's the, the theme of this game, the mechanics of this game? Because I'm not familiar with it yet, despite oh, all the uh, buzz. The theme is dim sum, so it's eating dim sum and ordering dim sum, and um, it has uh, like a an actual like lazy susan in it, so it's really quite neat. Um, so yeah, we're just we're just hoping that it it blows up. And is a great way to show off, uh, you know, Chinese culture in the gaming sphere. So, looks really wow. fun. Yeah. Wow. And definitely, the Canadian connection is there it. too. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Okay, Sen. What's your number nine then? Since Daryl oh, started yeah, with yeah, this yeah. number ten, what's we're your do, number? So we're nine? gonna do a snake. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. So my number nine is Nunami uh, by Thomas C. Manjok, uh, who is a, a designer um, who is into it, and. It is this really, really, really interesting game of balance uh, where you have to balance, you know, what you take from the environment, what's in the environment. Um, and, you know, when we talk about indigenous ways of learning and things like that uh, in education currently, this is a game that kind of fits all of it. It's like, hey, let's let's talk about how we are part of the ecosystem and what we take out of it and what we put back into it and all those types of things. And it's a, a really interesting way of showing the culture through the game. So that is my number nine, Nunabi by Thomas E. Bajak. Self-published, kickstarted, everything done by him, art, everything. So it's a one-man show. Is it a hard game to find? Because of, yeah, I mean, because it was a Kickstarter. I don't 
know it's actually out retail at all. I think it might have just went to Kickstarter. Uh, and this is another thing. I mean, a lot of creators don't know this, but it's really hard to get your game into stores if you have only one game. Like if you are a, a sole creator, sole publisher, you have one SKU, distribution won't consider it so unless you really want to beat the street and talk to individual store owners um, and things like that or have an amazon shop uh, of your own uh, i actually don't know i've talked to thomas e like he's been on the maple syrup show i haven't didn't actually ask him you know how he gets game out to people past the kickstarter so i don't know but we can mm-hmm. find out i guess we'll have to do some research we'll put it in the show notes underneath the episode when we post the episode yeah i've never i've never played that one so i'm looking forward to checking it out and trying it yeah, sounds interesting for sure. I, it's one that I'm not familiar with again, but that's why I wanted to do this was to talk to you guys about these games and learn about some new ones that I hadn't tried before. My number nine uh, is from a, a local designer and friend. I remember getting the opportunity to play test this um, and it's uh, designed by Stefan Alexander uh, and it's called Q-Birds. Uh, some people are starting to discover it actually through, I think it's Board Game Arena or one of the table top, uh, you know, online digital versions has a really good implementation. So people are starting to discover it. It did come out back in 2018, uh, a little under the radar um, by, I think the original publisher was Catch Up Games. And um, it actually has been picked up by a lot of different international companies. And my copy, which I'm really proud to have, um, I actually purchased while I was in Czech uh, in the Czech Republic and saw it on the shelf. And that was the first time I ever saw it on a shelf. So it was kind of a fun thing to know a friend who lives 30 minutes away that I play tested it. The first time I saw it was on the other side of the world. So that was just like a really kind of special moment. And it's a real simple set collection card game where you have birds on a wire and you're moving them around, trying to pair up some birds and, and collect them to score them. Uh, and it has a really cool, cool cubish art style so when people look it up it has kind of a distinct look which i think is really fun for it as well yeah, it's cute i didn't know anything else about the game other than the art and i certainly didn't know it was a canadian designer who lives yeah. down the road from you yeah <laughs> in canada right 30 minutes away is down the road yeah absolutely <laughs> true <laughs> uh so yeah so following that up my number eight uh is uh another ontario designer uh, who I regularly give a hard time to. We uh, often get in trouble with uh, arguing whose game is prettier. And, uh, and we have been uh, pretty bad at it. Uh, just to give a plug uh, for Snakes and Lattes has in the past and it's moved, moved out of Snakes and Lattes, but there's a Katanathon that raises money uh, to fight cancer. And every year, <laughs> this designer and I both, always go on Chris Christopher Chung and I, and we always uh, name the robber um, that we think <laughs> our game is more beautiful than their game. So that every time the robber gets rolled that we have to say that out loud. So it's a little bit of a, an insider joke battle we have going, but Christopher designed a beautiful and really great game called lanterns, the harvest festival, um, which is published by renegade games. And uh, again, uh, it was hard and that uh, to, to put it so low on my list because it is a game that I regularly play and I love. It's a tile laying game where you're trying to match up colors and, and gain different types of sets. And one of the things that I think is really unique and special about it is that every time you play a tile, everyone at the table uh, is affected. Everyone gets some cards. And so you're strategically trying to gain the cards that you want and you always have to give everyone else something. So you're trying to give them something that's not so useful. So that's like a really fun thing that keeps everyone engaged the whole game. Mm-hmm. Um, that is my number seven. So hey. I, I, huh? I, I will reverse my order here and talk about my number eight though. My number eight is Jab Real-Time Boxing uh, by Gavin Brown, published by Tasty Dimensional Games. This was a game that was uh, unfortunately a little bit ahead of its time, I think. It's it a was. real-time game uh, and it is quite possibly one of the best real-time games in existence. Um, it's just, you you have to like real-time games. If you like real-time games, uh, like Jesse and I like real-time games, oh boy, this is the best of the best of the best of the best. Um, and if you don't like real-time games, then it is completely frustrating for you. Uh, but it is a wonderful game. Uh, Gavin is now 
basically you know him as Roxley Games. That's that's basically Gavin's baby, and uh, Gavin's name comes up a few times in my list. I think, and he is also um, one of the people who did the first uh, graphic design and illustration on a game that I made. So he did the box and art and the rules and everything for train of thought also published by taste your minstrel so um yeah jab real-time boxing number eight on the list it is it would probably be higher if it was something that i could play with more people uh it's that type of thing that once you're really good at it nobody wants to play with you because they can't beat you you won't unless unless you're like making mistakes on purpose it's it's the kind of thing that drives you to play properly every time so that would be my number eight my number seven like i said was chris chung's lanterns the harvest festival for renegade games and uh a fun story about <laughs> about lanterns is that it didn't used to be about lanterns it used to be a uh, flower it used to be blossoms and about flowers and we met chris a uh, long time ago when he was working on a trading card game and he was like so big on this trading card game like oh man we got to play this and then we all kind of said, what's that over there? And he said, oh, you won't want to play it. It's this little game. It's about flower arranging and blah, blah, blah. And we sat around and played it. We're like, this this is the game, Chris. It's like, no, no, no. We should be, I should be pitching this trading card thing. It's like, no, no, no. You should be tra- pitching this. I mean, maybe you think about something other than flowers, but pitch this. And yeah. now I'd say pitch flowers too. Sure. Uh, gaming, gaming has changed in the last decade since, you know, it sounds funny to say that, lanterns has been around for a decade but it's it's almost been that long i think I'll yeah it came out in 2015 so yeah and and we saw it you know a few years before that so true 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 right so yeah it's, it hasn't been a decade yet but um since we saw it, it probably was about you know eight years nine years yeah so yeah that would be my number seven what's your I number do, seven daryl before oh. you go daryl i do love those games where every every turn the the opponents you know are involved somehow it affects the way that they can play or something that they're going to get so um i, I love those games that keep every especially if you're playing with kids or families you yeah. want to keep everybody engaged uh if there's too long of a wait in between turns it can be a little challenging to keep well, kids they can play the table. jab real-time boxing there's no yeah. way <laughs> no way kids whatsoever. table for jab while they're waiting for their turn <laughs> right. lanterns Daryl is actually famous for doing that, by the way. He is famous yeah. for two things. One is sleeping while playing. And the second thing is playing a second game while playing. So another game. So he could do that. He could do yeah. that. I am I am a little notorious for that. So sorry to anyone I've fallen asleep during the game, but he still but wins. I, I still I still win sometimes. So <laughs> he is playing. I am playing. I am thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your number seven, Daryl? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this game is, yeah, coming up to being 10 years old, uh, designed uh, by Yves Tournier, one of my favorite Canadian designers, um, out of your neck of the woods. Uh, he lives in Ottawa, and uh, and I haven't seen him for a number of years, but used to get the opportunity and chance to go up to Ottawa and, and play test some of his games. And this was a game I got to play test before it came out. Uh, but I, ever since I've been hooked and I love it. And actually I think it in many ways helped inspire Sagrada and that is blueprints. Uh, uh, it's yeah. a wonderful dice game where you're constructing and the different colored dice are different building resources and you're drafting dice and constructing with them. And actually, fun fact, originally, uh, one of the publishers I pitched Sagrada to originally was to Z-Man, and I pitched it directly to Zev and to and to so- Sophie as well. And Zev was really excited about the potential of putting Sagrada in the line with blueprints and kind of imagining, like, what if that could be part of that world? And so it didn't work out, uh, but it was pretty fun to even think. At the time, I was just so excited that people even enjoyed it. And the idea that it could be associated with a, one of my favorite games was was a big deal to me. And I'm very thankful that it worked out with Floodgate. I'm not complaining about that by any means. But it's just a, a fun little historical moment that that uh, that game it meant a lot to me. And I, I think it's a little under the radar. I think uh, people don't know it and should look, you know, seek it out because I think it's a real a real gem. It's a nice small box. And yeah, a lot of game in there. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's still being published, but I saw people playing it on Twitter the other day, and I thought, oh, that's awesome. Daryl, do you re- do you remember when you pitched it um, for uh, Sagrada? And uh, was it that we were, you're going to get like metal dice and stuff, like dice yeah. in the in the? That's right. Okay, okay, that yeah. was that game. That was yeah. so fun. Yeah. So back in the day, we were uh, definitely uh, influenced and 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 um, yeah, I still think it's a wonderful game. I, I still pull blueprints out uh, on a regular basis because it's a real great game to introduce to people. Yeah. And has it's a nice fast. little table presence and it's fast. So it was one of the first games I, I talked about on the channel. Oh, wow. oh that's good. Yeah. 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 I've had blueprints for ages. Now it is a small box, but at least our copy has an elastic around it to make yeah. sure all the it dice. Does, it does kind of bust the seams once you open it. It's a yeah. bit of a puzzle to get all those dice back in. So it definitely yeah, it, should be part of the game. Yeah. It originally came out in 2013 I mean, and, and yeah. I've been enjoying it ever since. So that really does explain why, you know, board gamers really like Cthulhu. It's like this non-Euclidean geometry of how to get stuff back in the box. Right. Right. It's like this other dimension. It's the final, it's the final game you get to play every night. Yeah. <laughs> I love a game that shows you in the instructions how to pack it back up again. Yeah, sure. That is cool too. So. That is a new thing. And more <laughs> games need that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was my number seven. My number six um is designed by a good friend of mine who i actually co-designed my first game with steven sour and uh he made a really cute uh fun deduction game uh with a uh very contagious uh name a punny name and that is perlock homes uh and it's furry Artie's trail uh originally published by idw games back in 2017 and I just heard on another stream, so I feel okay saying this because they said it, uh, but Arcane Wonders is actually in the process of remaking it and putting it out. Uh, I don't know when it's coming out, but I'm excited that it's going to be reprinted. But uh, Perlock Homes is one of my favorite games for kind of a, a cooperative deduction of, of trying to figure out the kind of the case. And so you, you, you almost Hanabi style, don't see all the information you're trying to uh, solve solve the puzzle. So that is uh, Perlock Holmes, uh, originally published in 2017, and hopefully coming out soon from Arcane Wonders. There you go. I that's love awesome. cooperative deduction. That's a that's a great thing for parents and kids to do together. Yeah, my number six is Steampunk Rally uh, by the one and only Orrin Bishop published by Roxley Games out of Alberta. And um, I like this game <laughs> for just the the sheer volume of dice that you get to throw. That's one of the reasons why yeah. I like it. I also like this great representation. All the, the cogs and bits are, are phenomenal. The art is, this was like, I believe, one of the first games that uh, the Mr. Cuttington crew did art for uh, out of yeah. Quebec. And they have since gone on to do like tidal blades and make that whole world and all sorts of great artwork from that whole team. And so uh, I think Steampunk Rally really does shine for what it is, which is this, this cool race game where you don't feel like it's this simple race game like a lot of other race games are very very simple uh in terms of what you're doing but steampunk rally you're actually building your ship this weird steampunk ship as you're trying to race across this landscape and get to the finish line uh and it has one of the best finishes in any game that i've ever seen because it doesn't finish when somebody gets to the gets over the finish line it it finishes when somebody gets the furthest over the finish line and everybody's taking their turns. Uh, so it's even, even amount of turns. And the best ending is when, you know, you make your ship explode. So it actually projects you faster and further across the finish line. So it's got some fun stuff in there. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend that and, and the, the sequel to it as well. Um, and that, that was, um, I believe it was one of Roxley's, you know, first big entries into yeah, this think, as well. I think so too. And they, uh, a shout out I got to give for the deluxe version because they had metal um, gears, which yeah. were amazing. So if you can ever track those down, those extra gears were so cool. Everything's yeah. really well done already. Yeah. But. 
there's i saw it when the exp- i think the expansion came out on kickstarter yeah. Yeah. several months mm-hmm. ago six months ago or eight yeah. months ago or something like that uh and the components just look amazing yeah yeah Roxley it always does roxley just blows blows that out of the water each and every time that that is that's kind of the thing um <laughs> way 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 back when when gavin wasn't you know publishing stuff and even now because roxy has this you know it's like we'll publish stuff but really we're a game you know game development laboratory is what they what they would say they are but they end up just like putting so much love and effort into their products as we'll see at my number four um that their games are you know without a doubt some of the best uh, produced games on the market and, you know, couple that with, you know, Gavin's amazing art sensibilities as an art director, graphic designer, and then, uh, you know, they run some of the tightest Kickstarters, the campaigns uh, bar none. Uh, so, you know, they are often rocks. The campaigns are often used as like the bar, at which, new campaign to look at and say, okay, how can I learn from this uh, because of the way that Gavin has used his skills to lay it all out. Uh, so definitely, definitely look at their campaigns. If you're a new creator and you want to get your game uh, funded on Kickstarter, running a good campaign is one way to do it. And, and the Roxy campaigns are always really uh, intelligently run from the graphic design perspective, as well as from the actual day-to-day so that was yeah, my number I, five yeah i backed radlands most recently that was their most mm-hmm. recent campaign that two-player yeah. card i cannot yeah. wait to get my hands on those cards this cards for, with special material <laughs> that are bendable and you can that throw is them also in the washing machine. also a gavin type thing to do right is materials like he loves that kind of stuff like um the iron clays he, he's very big on the tactileness of games so yeah um, i love my iron clays too yeah um it, I just realized, Daryl, why I didn't put uh, Crocodile on the list is because my number five is Catacombs. <laughs> uh, Catacombs is by Ryan Amos, Mark Kelsley, and Aaron West, uh, Elzra Games. And Elzra is this funny little company that I am tied to in a lot of weird ways. My friend Henry works for them now, who like I gamed in his, in his basement uh, when I went to university. Uh, and Elzra was originally in the uh, Dundas area around Hamilton, where I went to university. And then they moved to St. Thomas, which is like just 20 minutes away from me now. So got all these little combinations and ties to, to this company. But Catacombs was uh, is high on the list for a couple of reasons. Um, a, it was one of the first hobby games that Jay Cormier, my, one of my designing partners, ever bought me as a huh. gift. Yeah, he bought me like everything for it. It's like, this is amazing because he knows like I like Dungeons and Dragons sure. and things like that. And he's not into Dungeons and Dragons, but he likes board games. He likes dexterity games, obviously. So he bought me Catacombs and like we play it and it's like awesome. This is the best. And uh, I, have the, I have the old school, like black and white, hardcore heavy metal kind of art. Yeah. And then more recently, they've got my brother from another mother, Quad Chai Moria, to do the art uh, for it. And it's it's got this really super cute look now. Um, so Catacombs is my number five because I also like flicking games. I just like a little theme to it, I guess. Yeah. Flicking absolutely. in the dungeon. I, I love Catacombs as well. And I and the new artwork is is just amazing. I I love this the style of the new game. Yeah. Um, or the new version of the game. Fantastic. And I didn't get my hands on the neoprene mats that they were that came out not too long ago for that game i'd love to have a mat to flick those pieces on instead of a game board yeah uh, I, I just think that's a great idea uh, yeah, but I'm, excellent I'm, game i'm looking forward to conventions coming back and trying to track down one of those neoprenes because i mm-hmm. agree it, it's, it's fantastic and it looks so good quanch i did an amazing job i, I could ask okay <laughs> email henry <laughs> hey henry are there any neoprenes mat, mats left yeah, and just in St. Thomas, I can go drive and pick it up. Oh, yeah, he's still this. in Dundas, but oh. the company's in, in St. Thomas. <laughs> oh, yeah. The poor guy in Ottawa gets left out. I don't. No, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'd, I'd say are there two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, so we're on number five, right? What's your number yeah, my, five, Daryl? Yeah, my number five uh, is designed by someone who have I, I've had the pleasure of designing a bunch of games with. Uh, already mentioned. Uh, during the intro, Erica Boyoris, 
Um, we, we've made a bunch of games together and it's been a real pleasure. And uh, she worked on a, a game with a, a friend of ours, Andrew Wolf, who's not Canadian, but uh, maybe an honorary Canadian because he loves he, it here. He, and, he lives closer to Canada now. Yeah, he lives, he lives near the border. He lives in Seattle now, uh, but they made a game together uh, that was published by Cryptozoic. Uh, with the license of Steven Universe. So they made a, ga- a card game called Beach of Palooza, the card battling game. And uh, I think it's just like a really lovely entry level uh, licensed game that anyone can play. They really did a lot of work to make sure that the rule book was really accessible and that you didn't have to have game experience. That the hope is that maybe you're a Steven Universe fan and you'll check it out. Maybe you just think it's it's fun looking and colorful. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that it's a really lovely card game uh, that hasn't actually uh, hit stores yet. It was kickstarted um, in 2020 and it's kind of in the process of getting out to stores and, and delivering now. So um, there's some out there, some the, the Kickstarter fulfillment and we'll, we'll see, but uh, you know, I think it's a, a real lovely game that people can seek out. And then kind of following the same line, but going to my number four, uh, this is not only designed by a Canadian, but it is also published by an awesome Canadian company and, and following kind of the, the family friendly line of games. This is Fossilus. Uh, both Sen and I had the joy of seeing uh, David uh, design a few games over the years, especially meeting up with him at Fan Expo, which is a convention that happens in Toronto. And David would bring his prototypes out and we'd get to see what he was working on and kind of watch the evolution of his designs. And I know both Sen and I, when we first saw Fossilist, we were blown away. Yeah. His, his first copy, he actually made it with his son and it was made out of Legos. So that's how they figured huh. out how to do the 3D elements of it as they found some Lego pieces and made it out of Lego, which I thought was just like such a clever and innovative way to use something that we all know to try to build a prototype. You don't have to go out and spend a lot of money on trying to get 3D things made unless you have those skills and you want to do that. But they started there with something really practical and he came up with a really fun game uh, where I I believe, and I I mean, I I probably shouldn't quote me, but I believe David's son was really into dinosaurs. So he also helped kind of influence that design. And and then the Canadian publisher, Kids Table Board Games, uh, led by Helena Capel, uh, did like took it to another level talk about you know just like Roxley Helena uh, always makes the highest quality games they're they're like amazing they're marketed well the art's always done incredibly well and uh, so they did a kickstarter for that game it, it did wonderfully well uh, it delivered about a year ago I think and I feel like the last year especially I just keep seeing it popping up on everyone's yeah. favorite list and for good reason it's an incredible game people almost think of it because of its toy aesthetic that it's a kid's game but i think it's just a family game like everyone's gonna enjoy it everyone's gonna have a good time there's strategy but there's also just like finding those bones and getting to those those toy moments is just really satisfying so <laughs> yeah I think a real hands-on experience it yeah, looks like that game feels, for sure yeah it feels so good to play so uh that's like kind of a double shout out canadian designer and canadian publisher coming together and making something awesome. That is yeah, awesome. I've, I've got quite a few Canadian Canadian connections here. That's good. So that was that your number 4? That was my number 4, yeah. Good. Fossils. Yeah, and and, and yes, uh, David's son was definitely into dinosaurs quite a bit because I remember David's very first design that I ever saw was like these dinosaurs like he had all his son's dinosaurs yes on the table and like, right. they would fight each other and that's it was why awesome. i knew it was something like that yeah absolutely yeah for sure oh um, my son loved dinosaurs when he was younger i think yeah. i think that's a prerequisite I, yeah i think kids just like dinosaurs sure. um my number four is brass birmingham i thought i'd bring some of the heaviness uh back into the the mix here and uh, Brass Birmingham by Gavin Brown, Matt Tolman, Martin Wallace. Uh, so it has that Canadian connection in terms of the development and redesign uh, for Martin's original design, published again by Roxy Games out of Calgary. And uh, this has, <laughs> I have fond memories about this because of, you know where I first played this, Daryl? Where? Yes. Happens in January. You're involved. I'm oh, involved. We're really? all involved. 
Wow. Yeah, it's the first time I played it was at uh, one of your conventions. Yeah. Uh, and so I have fond memories of playing this with Adam and and uh, Jody and my wife. My Carrie played this. Wow. And Carrie doesn't play heavy games. So no. and she but she got it. She liked it. Yeah. And so that that's part of why it holds um, a big place in my heart. Uh, but the other reason why is just because it was a dark darn good game um brass uh in general is a good game but the birmingham um variant i guess i guess it's a whole new thing yeah. uh just kind of takes it to this new level um and i really quite enjoyed it so uh i think that is a solid number four for me solid number four for me um, it's, in, it's it's incredible to see the canadian games so highly ranked on like board game geek like yeah. that's one that comes out as you know around the world that is one of the the best oh yeah strategy games and, you can think of and it's canadian they have been toying with that game gavin and matt have been toying with that game ever since you know the original brass came out yeah. years and years ago uh they love it and they just like play it and play it and play it and try to fix it and then eventually they got enough you know clout to say, hey, Martin Wallace, can we change your game a bit? Uh, and so it's it's that kind of thing where they're all the work that they did with like, you know, Super Motherload and Jab Real Time Boxing and um, Undermining and all the games that they've made in the past led up to this, which is you know, it's kind of their the feather in their, their cap, their crown jewel of their existence. <laughs> like, you know, it's like Matt would probably say, I'm all done. I don't need to do anything more. Cause this is, this is his like Ark of the Covenant. Right. So there you go. Uh, and then my number three is oh, wait, before you a, get to number is, three, I have, I have to tell you my yeah, brass yeah. story, Sen. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. I I managed to finally get my hands on a copy of Brass because it's always sold out. Wherever I was it looking, is. it's always, you know, as soon as you get a copy, it's gone. So I finally managed to get a, a copy of Brass and I punched it. I was so excited to have people over to play this game. I'd read everything about it. I'd seen all the amazing reviews and the, the, the board is incredible looking. Every component to that game is great. Uh, and just, you know, as I'm about to, plan my board night in march 2020 oh no it's been sitting uh. on my shelf since i created the first video for brains on games and i cannot i've you know my my shelf kids sometimes will be over and <laughs> and my kids will be over but they're like oh that seems like it would be too heavy for us that'll be too heavy for us let's play crokinole let's play one of these other ones yeah. so i i i Every time I set up the lighting to create a video for Brains on Games, it's right behind my head. And I look at it. And just, <laughs> oh, I just can't wait for things to open up again. It's almost, yeah, almost over. over We're almost over. Almost We're through. almost through. Yeah. Wow. Through the wilderness. Yep. 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 So your number four sense, sorry, I interrupted you. And that that well, it was Brass Birmingham, but my number three, because oh. I think we're up to three, aren't we? Yep. Yes, we are. Yeah, okay. you're, you're right. And my number three is uh, another Canadian. Uh, duo uh, and a Canadian publisher, and it is by far um, one of the most underrated games. And I don't say that just because one of the co-designers is sitting here with us, but The Walled City uh, by <laughs> Stephen Sauer and Daryl Andrews, published by Mercury Games, has long, long, long been uh, one of the games that if anybody asks me, hey, is there this like, you know, a worker placement style, maybe game that I don't know about and you think I should play. It's like, get the walled city. That's like the first thing that comes out of my mouth. Uh, why? Because it just is criminally underrepresented in the gaming sphere. Uh, it is, it was Daryl's, it was your first real game, right? Darryl? Yeah, first published. Yeah, Absolutely. first published game. And uh, I think Stevens as well. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, both, we both use that as our, our game to to go through the game artisans mentorship program our, right we we both were were being mentored and and we use that as our 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 game to kind of build and and go through the whole process with so right and i don't say that this is my number three just because daryl was my mentee <laughs> that's not the point uh the point is that it is a really really good game that deserves more recognition than it's ever gotten um from you know critics from fans from press from all of that it, it it really is a super smart game um that tells the story of well i, I i'll let daryl tell the story what is the yeah. bald city about well, daryl 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, first off, thanks for the kind words. And, and yeah, Stephen and I, uh, we're really proud to make it. And, uh, and actually we're, I, we're working on a new game right now. So we're getting the old band back together. Ooh. So, uh, a little hint out there to keep eyes out. Uh, it's super early in the journey. So, but, um, the walled city, uh, we, we worked on it. Um, originally like the, the theme came to us pretty early on, but it's based in the, the London dairy, which is, a bit of a controversial city uh, because depending on where you're from and your perspective, you might call that place dairy uh, and uh, because of different heritage and different experiences. And so when we played around with playing, we wanted to tell that story and we wanted to, to face that on and kind of uh, talk about kind of this, this uh, area that was being colonized and, 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 uh, um, controlled and so we built it around this idea of that there were um english and irish different tokens and if if you built it in a way uh that you didn't protect or like wall off then then the meeples the the english would run away out of fear and so that was where we we started cooking it around was this idea that um they might be brave but they also might be chickens that run away um even though they kind of colonized the area so we we kind of like took it on and, and, and faced the, the realities of that. And, and thankfully people understood and where we were coming from and, and how we told that story. And so, yeah, we, we were really happy with, with how it turned out. Yeah. And I just hope that, uh, you know, someday it, it gets the life of a new, a new life or something. I think it's a wonderful game. So oh, thanks then. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, my, my number three, uh, is again another combo. This publisher has been talked about a lot already. Uh, Roxley, who's phenomenal, and and my personal favorite Roxley game is this, and that is Santorini, designed by uh, Gord Hamilton. Um, I think his nickname is Mr. Pickles or Math Pickle. Math Pickle. Math thank Pickle. You. Yeah. Uh, who has done a lot of really great stuff in the learning learning space to make some fun, creative ways to embrace different math stuff uh, in real fun ways. And Santorini has been this game that actually was designed back before I even knew Gord back in 2004, has a bit of a, a horror story of that it got signed and tied up in, in legal uh, messes for a while as companies changed and bankruptcies and all that kind of stuff. And finally, when it got freed up, freed up uh, Gavin had played the game and knew of the game back from his origins as Gord, I think was one of his regular game night play tester people that they hung out at the time and, and knew the game, loved the game and brought new life to it with the, the incredible production and art. And they added all these different gods to it and whatnot. It originally was just big chunky blocks and that was, it, it was just like, yeah, it was literally an abstract, blue, blue an abstract game. Yeah, it was yes. super abstract, super satisfying. It was like this really clever, you know, it has almost like a chess feel to it, but even simpler, uh, where you would, you know, try to uh, meet the conditions to win. And then uh, Gord and, and the team at Roxley came up with so many twists of asymmetrical abilities. I look back at when they kickstarted that, that was like one of the originals and so many people have learned from their example. As, as Sen was mentioned, they're kind of like the, the prime example of how to run a really good Kickstarter. And this was one of the early ones as well, I think <laughs> shortly after Steampunk Rally, where they kept adding more and more different. I, 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 it blew my mind how they came up with so many different ways to give people unique powers and that they balanced out each other in really fun ways. So uh, Santorini, I think, is like a really clever game, uh, but it's still not intimidating. Um, to try to learn and it has awesome table presence so yeah you can strip uh, everything out of it and still have a great game yeah and still have a classic good game and they just put out which i ordered it but i'm still waiting for my copy is a new york edition so there's one where you can actually play on the grid system of new york instead of on the island of santorini so um, i'm excited to get my new york version yeah they still named it santorini but it's yeah, santorini they did. new york <laughs> it's really new york you never knew right the, the, yeah, i love it i love it I, have, <laughs> I i met gord i didn't meet gord i talked to gord on the phone 
uh, through through the process of doing all of these things that I've been doing over the past year, the same kind of way that I met the two of you. Right. Uh, and oh my goodness, he recommended so many awesome games. Of yeah. course, not not his own game. Of he course, say, this is the best game. This is. You know, I guess that would be the Canadian way to do it, right? You'd never <laughs> recommend your own game. You recommend other people's games. But yeah, he recommended um, Coimbra was one. Mm. Uh, Airland and Sea, he said, mm, was yeah. one of his favorite games, just the simplicity of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, every time I played Santorini, I've had a good time. Yeah. There no, he, he is, to me, an example of a designer that really celebrates and enjoys elegance. He is mm. uh, really uh, a keen eye to reduce things and cut things and try to, you know, boil everything down to really tight and meaningful decisions. And I, I think he, he models that and even his taste in games. And my, my funny uh, connection of Gord and Walt city is one time I made the mistake. Gord is not uh, great with sitting in a pitch meeting. I, I was pitching the Walt city and trying to find a publisher for it. And I just recruited Gord. Hey, come sit. I need another player. Uh, while I play this with a publisher. And uh, thankfully, you know, Gord is a really kind and, and generous person and sat in and, and was willing, but I didn't realize this until after the fact, and I learned from this, that uh, I didn't give him any instructions. And one of the things I probably should have advised is maybe don't try to redevelop the game while we <laughs> are playing it with a publisher I'm trying to pitch it to. And so throughout the game, he made a lot of suggestions on how, what should get cut from the game and how it could be made simpler or what, you know, and, and it was from a really good place. I know his heart and his intent was just to help. And, and yet it, it didn't help the pitch very well. So, didn't help it at all. so that didn't, that didn't go so well, but. Yeah. But Gordon, Gordon, Gordon's not the greatest big man, but no. he's a really good developer. Yes. Really good. Uh, was that your number two? Oh no. So sorry. So that was my number three, my number two. Uh, published again by a Canadian publisher, uh, a, a fantastic duo that are making some more games and they've even continued to extend this line. Uh, but the publisher's name is Steeped Games and it's co-designed by Connie and Dan Kazmaier. I might be saying mm -hmm. that wrong. Uh, but they made a lovely game called Chai. Uh, not only am I just a huge fan of Chai Tea anyways, so they had me at the theme, but it is a really fun game, a really again accessible game where you're moving around some cute tokens and gaining some resources and trying to fulfill some you know recipes and whatnot it it, it just really satisfying this nice chunky bits is again we're, we're mentioning these companies that are doing a really wonderful job of production um and it, it it's just like a really satisfying quick game you can get around the table with a bunch of people teach it play it and be you know scored and cleaned up in less than an hour so Sometimes that's really important so that you can, you know, maybe even play a second game or that's all the time you have. So, uh, and, and since then, I know that they've made Chai for two and they're working on some other games. So I'm really, I haven't tried the others yet, but I know for me, uh, ever since that came out in 2019, Chai has been just a really uh, go-to game for me and uh, another great game on the landscape of other great Canadian design games. So Yeah. Dan, said, Dan sent me the, Dan sent me the deluxe version of that game and the components are amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Just like it, it is another one of those games. It's just really satisfying to hold in your hand and move those pieces around. And the marketplace is one of my favorite marketplaces, honestly. Yeah. I think they, uh, they, they really did some really cool stuff with their whole line of, of tea related things and steeped games. Um, they, they have, they've got like awards from like, the tea society or yeah. I, I don't know who they are exactly, but that's amazing because yeah. they are doing something to, per, you know, to advance tea culture yeah. uh, in the world through a game instead of through tea. And that was recognized by the industry that is not the gaming industry, but the tea industry. Yeah. And I think that's phenomenal. Um, and that's what we get when we have, diverse ideas and diverse people making diverse games uh, and the real passion behind it. Right. Yeah. Because he, uh, he said, when he sent me this package, I opened it up. I was so excited. And my wife was like, what are you, but she was excited when I pulled out, he sent tea along with it. Yeah. Right. So, 
<laughs> so so she's like, oh, now we got tea now. Oh, there's a have, board game too. Yeah. <laughs> tea to drink while you're playing the board game. There you go. Exactly right. right. She thought the cups were really, the, the cups, the deluxe set she thought were really cool. So they maybe are. I'll be able to get her to the table for that one. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, I do talk about certain games as being like, you know, coffee games or in this case, a tea game where you can like, drink tea and or drink coffee and talk to people while you're playing the game yeah. and how comforting that can be and how cozy that can be. Yeah. Uh, like Sagrada fits in that as well, where it's like, you know, it's not the deepest, most strategic game in the world. And sometimes you don't need that. Um, and then sometimes you get those games that are kind of cozy, drink tea, play game, while it is still going to have some strategic decisions to it and all that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of those games are where people's heads are at. Um, they don't necessarily want Brass Birmingham and that's okay. Right. Very cool. Um, do you want to save your number one till later? Well, yeah. So why don't you, you, you still need to do your number two. Yeah, I do. And then, and then we can venture. Into so, so my, my number two is, um, we've mentioned some of these people and we've mentioned some of these publishers before it's uh it's the the flip side of kick uh, of kid table board games so it's burnt island games this time it's uh josh and helena instead of helena and josh i guess i don't know <laughs> it really it's still helena running the show um but it's in the hall of the mountain king by jay cormier and graham yans and um this is a great great game that is you know spawning um a line of games now uh just hit kickstarter a couple days ago two two three days ago uh follow the mountain king which is not designed by the same team but in the same storyline and so this game is fascinating in terms of all the work that has gone to it uh got into it from all sides of the team uh and obviously i know this from the design side being jay's co-designer and tested the game i was the one who actually pitched it to helena and josh um and then i play tested graham and jay's game iterations to make it a co-op game to make it a solo game to, to do all these things that were, were asked of them after the fact uh and so i've seen this inside and out and then i did an interview with Everybody on the team except Sean wasn't there at the time at Fan Expo when Quan Chai and Jay were guests. I brought all of them to Fan Expo and then Josh and Helena obviously live in Toronto, so they were there too. We had an interview with them, uh, which is on the Meeple Syrup um, channel somewhere. I believe it's on our YouTube, www.youtube.com backslash Meeple Syrup. Um, and it's a really interesting interview because it takes it from all the sides from design art publication development marketing afterwards all this kind of stuff so it's, it's a really neat story uh, but the game itself is amazing uh and it just has this cool mechanism where everything you do just cascades into other things and other things and other things um to go along with the the inspiration for the game which was the song in the hall of the mountain king which just keeps on you know, more instruments get added. It gets more frenetic and frantic um, until you have, you know, thousands of like symbol clashes everywhere and all this stuff. And that's the the feeling that the game provides uh, by design. That was the whole idea behind it. So I really enjoy that game. I, I think the, the cascading mechanism along with the puzzliness of the polyominoes to make the tunnels and then the goals of having to move these things up and up levels is, is it's just a great game. So that is my number two. It's a good one. Yeah. I got, I got to play test that one a few times and, and in general uh, I'm a big fan of, of both designers and Jay obviously makes a lot of games with Sen. So I'm a big fan of that. I, I had restricted myself to not pick any games with Sen, which knocked a lot of them out for Jay. For me. Sorry, Jay. Sorry, Jay. And then, uh, and then on top of the fact too, uh, I, I really love that game. I, I've forced myself the restraint of, of just about 30 minute games or less. So unfortunately that the last couple I'm a huge fan of, and I'm, there's a lot more that we didn't mention that I'd love to, you know, honorable mentions or, or considerations, but uh, we had to whittle it down. So it's tough. <laughs> it's tough to just pick 10. I'm amazed that we only had one overlap though. Since uh, uh, that's, that's impressive. Oh, lanterns. Yeah. 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 That's the only link. 
Yeah. So, <sighs> Sen, are you are you going to go first with your number one? I went oh. I went first with the ten. Oh, what was your number two? My number two was Chai. Oh, okay, no. okay. And my number okay. three was Santorini. Right, right, right. I, I was losing place in my head. Oh, okay. So I'll I'll say my number one. My number one is actually strangely enough, uh, it's Josh Dirksen's game by WizKids. Star Trek Alliance, the Dominion War campaign. Nice. And I'll tell you a long and storied tale of why it is my, my number one. It's my number one because Josh uh, is a, an amazing dude, uh, amazing designer and graph designer, but he is most amazing because of all the love and effort he put into uh, Heroes of the Aturi Cluster. And if you don't know what Heroes of the Aturi Cluster is, where were you when X-Wing first came out? When X-Wing first came out, it was you know, a two-player game. And Josh decided, what if it was a campaign game? And yep. what if we used all the components and all these boxes and all these ships to make this cool story? And you had this evolving campaign where your characters could like, increase as pilots. And you could add stuff to your ships and all this kind of stuff. And it was hands down like my best gaming experience of that year. Um, I played with a bunch of people who actually now live in Ottawa, uh, Eric and Nassim, um, my crew from London who uh, all leave me apparently. Everybody that comes to London, like Daryl, eventually leaves. Jesse <laughs> leaves. Eric leaves. Everybody leaves except me. Um, and then uh, we played for like, I don't know, a long time, probably like almost two months worth of play at um, the old cafe that used to be here. And uh, it's just this wonderful, wonderful campaign where the enemies have this AI that Josh made up and all this kind of stuff. And the fans, fans were clamoring for this thing. They're like, hey, FFG, why don't you make this for real? And FFG just couldn't, for whatever reason, couldn't do it. And so... Later on, uh, down the line, uh, Josh is doing some work for WizKids uh, through Lynn Vander and WizKids are doing some stuff together. And Josh says, hey, you guys also have a flight path game. Um, Star Trek Alliance is based on the same exact flight path system that powers uh, X-Wing. So all the little templates that you fly along. And they said, sure, let's do that. And it became Star Trek Alliance, Dominion War Campaign. And I have a copy here and I am really looking forward to playing it with my son. At least I think it's only two players. So I can only play with one son. Um, you can buy more boxes and put them together, but we'll see. The other son is now more interested in basketball, the game. So we'll see what he does. He'll just be outside shooting hoops, I guess. But yeah, so Star Trek Alliance, Dominion War Campaign is my number one because I've waited for so long for it to become a real thing for Josh. And I think I'm, I'm just really more of a cheerleader for Josh. Uh, and the game is amazing. The system that he set up for the AI is really, really intuitive. Um, and it ta- turns something that is competitive into something that's cooperative. And I think that's really, really special um, in terms of taking a game and kind of flipping it 90 degrees. So that's my I, number th- one. I always thought that movement system uh, for X-Wing, and I haven't played the Star Trek one yet, but the movement system when we played with X-Wing I just found it, uh, it, it, was, it was so exciting and interesting mm-hmm. because you don't know where all the ships are going to end up. So you're thinking about your actions yeah. and you're deciding with these little rulers where it's going to wind dials. up. Uh, so clever, I, yeah. I think. Uh, it's a, it, the Star Wars one is a game that I really enjoyed. I wanted to try Alliance, but now it sounds like the campaign game is the way to go. Maybe. And, and like, let's not get it twisted. I am... By far, and in, in large, uh, like I'm much more a Star Wars fan than a Star Trek fan, but I will support Josh in this endeavor <laughs> just to make <laughs> this darn thing happen. I will Absolutely. play with Romulans and Klingons and whatever. That's cool. I didn't even know that that was uh, from Josh, but uh, I definitely remember the prototype. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember getting to play that a few times at different designer nights and experience parts of it. So it's exciting to hear that it's now out in the r- real world, you know, as a yeah. finish final published product and and again like that that system i i I didn't i didn't play a lot of x-wing but i i did play uh wings of war back right which is the same system same system and and i remember even we would play on the floor and you know play all over the house and stuff like that it was a really fun way to to go go big with it so we'd had a million different uh different models of different uh, world war ii um 
planes. I used to play that all the time in London uh, with Abe <laughs> Ocharn and and a few of that crew. So that yeah. was a lot of fun. Uh, my my number one, I think, is uh, criminally under the radar. Uh, it is a uh, Canadian designer, Canadian publisher, a small publisher that some people don't know about, but I think they make incredible games, and that is uh, First Fish Games. Uh, out of the West Coast, uh, led by Stephanie Kwa. And um, she she found this game by Eric. Again, I'm, I'm probably butchering his last name. Ra- is it Raoul? Roy. Roy. Thank you. Um, I'm horrible with people's names, so my apologies. <laughs> uh, but uh, Eric designed this lovely game called Town Builder. Um, and I... Coverdin. Coverdin is uh, uh, based on, I think, uh, Coverdin's in Holland. Is yeah, that? it's based on on where his his ancestry's from. Thank you. Yes, and so mm-hmm. the game is this just lovely, beautiful uh, card game. Very tight design. It reminds me of if someone likes a game like say Splendor or something that's you know a little engine buildy, a little you know like you combo things up together. Uh, it, it's very condensed. It doesn't take up a lot of table space. Uh, the deluxe version is really nice because they had a rolled up mat that even fit in the box, which I thought was really neat. And I I like using that version all the time, but it's just the kind of game that uh, every time I play it with people, people are like, Oh, let's play again. And, uh, and that is to me a testament of a really great, you know, gateway type game because uh, people are a just like excited that they learned it, but then they want to play right away. And that just shows that like, it's kind of, and contagious it gets it gets people excited and and so that is one my number one um uh, game that's uh canadian design canadian published uh and we could we could have listed a lot more there i mean <laughs> uh myself uh, as a shout out that uh, i have to mention about sen is that uh i got into the hobby and why i ended up getting mentored by sen was that sen and jay co-designed my my all-time favorite game belfort and and because of falling in love with that game, I got to know them and even got to play test as they developed expansions for it and all that. And that really got me hooked and, and into game making. So that was strictly because I was part of running some board game tournaments across Canada called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz. And we would always celebrate one round of the tournament would be just Canadian designed games. And we did the tournaments from you know Nova Scotia all the way to Vancouver at game stores across the country, and then uh, we'd always make sure that there would you know no matter who was running the tournament, that they would always use one round to try to highlight some Canadian content. So it's like CanCon how, for board games. Yeah, and it was it was just really really a fun way, and I discovered games like Wasabi, which is out mm-hmm. of Canada, but designed by Josh Capel, another lovely game that I hope comes back someday, and that. You know, there's a variety of party games and and whatnot that we discovered that were Canadian designs as well. And and yet, you know, for this, I, I, I put some added restrictions on myself so that yeah. I come up with a top 10. I'd tell uh, just the um, the Coverdon story. Uh, I learned that game <laughs> while running through. Um, this is how easy it is to learn the game. Um, going to back to Daryl's comment about it's real, it's real easy to pick up. Is Stephanie and Gord taught it to me while we were running through the hallways at Origins to try to get out after like the end of the day when you when they locked down the hall. Uh, we were they were teaching me like we'd stop at like every second table we found and just play a little bit and then move on to the next table as they'd <laughs> kick us out even further and further. Um, and so yeah, it's wonderful. I actually don't have a copy anymore. Mm-hmm. I gave my deluxe copy away to Scott Vien Vliet, uh, because he's Dutch. Uh, yeah. And I it was his birthday and I hadn't opened the copy yet. I've already played it, you know, and it, uh, the original co- the you know I play tested it and Eric's a good friend and all that kind of stuff. So it's like oh I'll buy this. And then I thought, oh, you know who would really appreciate this? Somebody who actually has a tie to Holland. Yeah. And so I gave it to him. And he, and he says, you know, I played it with my dad, played it with my brother. He's played it with his uncle. He's played it with everybody in his family because they're like, oh, Coveridon, we know what that is. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's been this really nice um, thing for Scott to have 
to get some of his family who's not necessarily into gaming to at least play a game with him because it's you know about holland so he uh, he really quite likes it and it's a beautiful game uh it's really art is is great and then the the presentation is wonderful that's one thing if you ever get like a uh fresh fish game you're gonna see you know it's gonna be top quality um i think that's the that's the interesting thing about a lot of the the brands that come out of Canada, uh, the smaller ones who are now becoming big, like Kids Table Board Game, Burnt Island, Roxley, uh, and Fresh Fish, um, they they are all like a, they all have like a graphic designer, illustrator as part of the core team. Uh, and that's why you get to see some of this amazing looking stuff. Even if, you know, Josh isn't the one doing the actual art, he's doing the art direction. Same thing with Gavin, you know, same thing with Gord. They're all doing parts to make these things look amazing. And and then they all care about the the tactile nature. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into these games that you just never think about. And um, I think Canadians do it great. I think they're doing a really good job of representing uh, the possibilities of the tabletop from the great white North. So, yeah. Which is amazing here. We've had not quite 20 games, I guess 19, because there was overlap with one, only one That's game long. between the two lists. Lanterns, man. Chris Chung. Right. 19 different games designed by Canadians. But, but Daryl, your game, your game is prettier. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate well, it. Even in comparison, well, we talked about blueprints, but I, I see a box of Sergato there behind you, and and that is a pretty game. There's no question about it. That's for sure. So we've got all these beautiful game. games. You know, it's like Canadians to export games the way we export comedians. You know, yeah. where Americans would have no idea. Here's a game designed by a Canadian, published by a Canadian, uh, they, and they it's really one don't. of their favorite games. You know? It was funny. Um, when was it? It was maybe four years ago when somebody asked Tom Vassell you know, who to look out for next. And he said, the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think that's changed. I think we're looking out further away from North America now, yeah. which is great. Uh, lots of good games coming from lots of other places too. But very, very proud to to be able to just to talk about all these amazing Canadian designers and publishers. Um, and we didn't even talk about, you know, games that have a connection just through art. Or sure. something like that. There's a lot of like tidal blades, you know, obviously yeah. would be up there in terms of art because the, the artists are Canadian. So, yep. yeah, I was thinking party games. There's a lot like real yeah. marketing from Adam Wise or Decrypto, Trivial Pursuit, <laughs> Trivial Pursuit designed in the Kitchener Waterloo area, Balderdash, Game of Things, mm. you name it. Lots so. of good stuff. Yeah. Daryl, before we started this conversation, Sen said Daryl really loves making lists. And I had I the email from daryl that had his top 10 and then two lists of five honorable mentions yeah <laughs> i love I, it's hard it's hard not to to give shout outs for more wonderful games yeah i he, love that he you said guerrilla marketing i love that you said guerrilla marketing as a party game because that is a game that's uh, the artwork uh you know production value is amazing on that yeah. kind of that, that is criminally got. unknown i mean it yeah. is so fun anyone who gets that game they would never get rid of it because it's just, mm -hmm. it produces a lot of really wonderful moments. And uh, I'm looking forward to when conventions are safe to go back to, because I'll, I'll probably have that on me because it's just a real fun after hours excuse to just get a bunch of people together and have a laugh. Yeah. Oh, it's really silly. Yeah. I think they the definitely think, so even in my list, I was looking at it going, you know, there's not a lot of games for the last two years. I wonder why. Now I remember. Well, we haven't been playing games a lot yeah. for the last two years. So um, I do have some that are within the last couple of years. Uh, but most of those are games that I've played already or before or, or been able to be a part of the production of or play testing of. So uh, there are definitely a couple that are missing from this list, probably because I just haven't. Yeah, more to yet. discover. Yeah. More to discover. Yours to discover. Yeah. Now <laughs> oh, we're getting to the license plates. Ah, oh, the license oh, plates. Oh, no. We don't want to get into that discussion. <laughs> Open for business. No, we're not. No, no. Well, guys, listen, it was so great talking to you about this stuff. I learned about a lot of new games and some personal stories about playtesting and designers and conventions. Uh, what a great way to celebrate Canada Day. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, we'll have to do it again next year. Oh. That'd be awesome. Daryl could put <laughs> okay. different restrictions on his list. Yes, he 
could have <laughs> just, just tell me what they are before so we actually have like you know no, but it was great because then we had such different lists it's true it's perfect we got 19 different games out of this whole process now if people wanted to find the stuff that you guys are working on or that or wanted to get in touch with you to talk about one of your games uh what's the best way to reach sen or daryl the best way to reach me is probably through twitter at sen fung lim s-e-n f-o-o-n-g-l-i-m yeah and also a plug for maple syrup uh, anyone yeah. especially that there's a wonderful meeple syrup shop talk group in facebook that's uh just a lovely community if anyone's interested in game design and chatting about that i know uh, i got to be part of it uh near the start with send but it's continued to grow and blossom and there's more and more people contributing and and uh so if someone is interested in especially on the game design side I, you know, that's the first place I point people is check out a few episodes of like maybe your favorite designers because they've interviewed everyone. And also, uh, you know, if, if you want to join a community and chat and have questions, that's a, you know, a really uh, wonderful, welcoming place uh, to, to find some people and be inspired. So uh, for myself, uh, you can probably find me on Facebook. That's kind of the best way to reach me, but I'm also on uh, Twitter and, and other social media channels you can usually find me uh usually it, it includes my middle initial with an m so it looks like daryl mandrews but that's daryl d-a-r-y-l-m-a-n-d-r-e-w-s I and mean, i'm on twitter and whatnot and i love talking about games and uh so any excuse to do that even on you know i'm starting to check out tiktok and clubhouse and and other avenues oh yeah Just daryl's very active on to, clubhouse yeah try to find ways to connect with people and celebrate games and and uh yeah are you doing dances on tiktok yet not yet you know i'm so i'm still working on my moves so. okay <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well happy canada day to both of you guys thanks so much for joining me today yeah happy canada day yeah you too thanks very much thanks so much to daryl and sen for being on the show i'll include their their social connection information in the show notes for this episode but if you have any questions for me or suggestions for the show you can leave them in the comments below the video or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca brainsongames.ca is the website that's where future episodes will go and the previous episodes are up there already brains on games is the twitter handle and the facebook page and the instagram feed so we're all over the place and if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones you can head on over to youtube and click that subscribe button Thanks for joining me and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.